Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join a community cultivating civil discourse. Stay well informed while improving access to enlightening and thought-provoking programming for all. I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate, sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing it. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inform at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to today's program with EMILY's List President Stephanie Shriok. We're here today to discuss her new book, Run to Win, Lessons in Leadership for Women Changing the World. She'll be in conversation with Marisa Lagos, club friend and correspondent for California politics and government at KQED. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the comment or chat section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but we're dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programming in 2021. We do ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work this year and beyond. Visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more about our online programming. And you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 live during this program. You can find this and more in the description box below. 
Now, please join me in welcoming Marisa Lagos and Stephanie Shriok to Inform. Thank you so much. And hello to our audience. Welcome to today's virtual program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Marisa Lagos, correspondent for KQED's California Politics and Government Desk and co-host of the Political Breakdown podcast. This afternoon, I am super excited to be in conversation with Stephanie Shriok. Stephanie is president of EMILY's List, the political action committee that has elected more than 1,400, that's 1,400 Democratic women to political office. I think they've raised like some $600 $600 million over that time. And Stephanie's going to talk to me today at Inform about her new book, Run to Win, Lessons in Leadership for Women Changing the World. As we just mentioned, if you want to ask Stephanie a question, please put it in the chat on YouTube or comment section on Facebook. We'll try to get through as many as possible uh, towards the end of the program. Although if you have a question sooner and it's relevant, I will try to get to it as we talk. Let's get started. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for joining me. Oh, it is fabulous to be here uh, with all of you on this virtual uh, Commonwealth Club event. I am just a huge fan of the Commonwealth Club and a little heartbroken we're in the middle of a pandemic and I'm not there in person. It's because it's been a dream of mine. So one of of these, I've been in the audience before. So one of these days, uh, I hope to be with you, Marisa, in person uh, to to celebrate these moments. Uh, But this is our new community for the time being, and I'm just so honored to be here with you today. I know, watching that intro video, you're like, they're sitting so close. There's no masks. Oh, my gosh. Exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. I was like, they're touching things, and they're like, right there. <laughs> Isn't it funny to think how quickly the world has changed? Yeah. Um, well, I have like a gazillion questions for you but I about the book and about the work you've done over the past um, 10 or so years, but I want to start with what's in the news right now. I feel like it would be weird not to, honestly. We have had um, just an unbelievable week, past week in politics. The insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th, followed by the second impeachment, only second ever of the same president. Um, As somebody who helped to get some of these members into that Capitol building, talk to me about what you thought watching this. And you're not so far away from D.C. um, and Virginia. That's right. That's right. And you know, our Emily's List offices are in downtown D.C., and so I think about this. I've got staff who live uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, we have a lot of friends who work on Capitol Hill. I used to be chief of staff for Senator John Tester. Yeah. I've walked those halls. I've been in those buildings. Uh, I've talked to both uh, some of our freshman members. I mean, just think about it. We have a you know a number of brand new members uh, to the U.S. House, and you know, think about. Congresswoman Cory Bush or Nakima Williams, Carolyn Bordeaux, Marino. There's a, a number. Yeah. This was like day three of their tenure in Congress. And I, I just, I was really struck by what that was like to be, what that would, would have been like standing on the floor of the U.S. House, uh, having a debate over something that usually is just a, pro forma process that you just go through. But because of our political environment, we have a a person who is in the presidency who just refuses to to believe the uh, electoral result. And so this is already strange, right? It's an already strange situation. And it was just shocking. Like like every American, I I hope, uh, felt that it was just a shocking thing to see. And I, one other thing, I so I was here in the Washington D.C. area during 9/11. I was at the mm-hmm. Democratic National Committee building, uh, working at the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, and I, re- you know, like like all of us, remember that day if we were were around, and particularly here. And the thing about that day, uh, it was so terrifying here in Washington because obviously we didn't know exactly what was going on. Uh, And I remember members and their staff running out of the buildings, running down the street to get out of there. And it was traumatizing. And what I thought of on the 6th was that they couldn't even run. They had to shelter in place and hold on tight, not knowing what was going to happen, uh, probably watching the news and hearing what was going on outside, but could not go outside. Yeah. Could not go. And I just think that 
trauma is is something we have to be aware of and and yet they 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 sucked it up and they're like, we're going to go back on the floor and we're going to do our job. And I'm so proud of Speaker Pelosi uh, and her constant leadership in all of this uh, to rally those troops. I mean, she really had to rally those members, I'm sure, to go back on the floor and to get done uh, what needed to be done, which was the certification of uh, of our election and our democracy. Yeah, I think that was really important to send that message because that was the Absolutely. point of this attack, right, was to disrupt our democracy. Correct. Um, I was just talking to former Senator Barbara Boxer, and it's funny, she also brought up her experience on 9-11 and watching this. And it's so strange, you know, as somebody who has covered not the nation's capital as much, but the state capital, city halls, you know, we're so used to the security, but also just the... um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, there's a certain level of respect that you just have for these buildings and these institutions. And, you know, in the, in the Capitol in Sacramento, I'm always like, Oh God, is the Sergeant going to look at me sideways and kick me off the floor. And it was really very bizarre to watch. I mean, the other thing that struck me as I was thinking about this interview was the attack specifically on female members of the caucus. I mean, we heard AOC say she didn't feel safe going into one of the rooms because she felt that some of her Republican colleagues might actually tweet out where she was. We did see one new member from Colorado um, tweet out Nancy Pelosi being evacuated. We've seen, you know, several members and their families get COVID because of folks who wouldn't wear masks. I mean, What's your sense in terms of both the safety, but also whether because they're women, these Democrats tend to be more targets by these far right groups? Women are often uh, the targets uh, because part of what these right wing uh, groups and and frankly, autocratic dictator, you know, dictators, what they do is try to marginalize women in the process of gaining and holding power because they're this, they, there's a reason they use the word strong man for a leader like this, right, is to make it all about masculinity and strength. And supposedly women are not that. Well, we all know differently. I mean, women are full of strength and power uh, and, and backbone and ready to take this all on. But, but it is a different level of attack on our women candidates. And frankly, I would argue on our women executives, on our women in every industry, mm-hmm. women journalists. I've had so many conversations uh, with women journalists who, who get attacked extra hard. I'm, you, you may be in that that situation, particularly online, where there's there's anonymity to doing that. Right. Uh, and it's a it is a concern of ours. But on the other hand, these are these are tough women. Right. They're, they're like, okay, fine. You're going to bring like AOC. You know, Nancy Pelosi has been dealing with this her entire, in her literally her entire career. They just keep fighting through it. And I think uh, it's exactly why uh, organizations like, like mine, Emily's List does the work we do because our, our hope is that once we get to that place, that magical place when there are at a, at a minimum a equal number of women and men sitting at our decision-making tables across the board, that, that this will start decreasing. But we're just, we got to keep being intentional about that work. We have a lot of work to do. Well, uh, an audience member brings this up and I actually had it on my list too, but you know, <laughs> all women are not the same. And while you have worked your entire life to elect democratic pro-choice women, We have people like QAnon supporter Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren uh, Boebert from Colorado, who has embraced some conspiracies and and really put out some really inflammatory things. I mean, I guess the the audience member asked, what does it feel like for you? But I guess the other question is, like, is gender equality enough? Because I wouldn't think that you would rather one of these women be in Congress than a Democratic man who shared your values. (laughs) Right, and we and, and we ran against yeah. <laughs> we had good pro-choice Democratic women yeah. running uh, uh, against some of these folks uh, as well, and, and and we'll continue to do that because you're exactly right. I mean, not all women obviously are the same, uh, and we, you know, it's one of the reasons Emily's List is committed to pro-choice Democratic women for a reason. Uh, one, because being pro-choice 
is really about a value system of freedom and ensuring that women have agency to make decisions about their lives and their families. And if they don't have that basic right to make those decisions, they don't have anything. Yeah. Uh, so that's a value system. We believe in the Democratic Party because they, uh, though we've had to push over the years at different times, uh, particularly since the beginning of Emily's List, but the Democratic Party is a party committed to opportunity for women and communities of color. Not that we have done it right all the time as a party, but we definitely have a commitment uh, underneath everything. And the Republican Party just doesn't mm -hmm. on both those issues. And so it really does matter. Now, all that being said, uh, I, I like to say that the Republican Party would be in better shape and would not be so far out of the mainstream of American politics if there were more women engaged in their party. But there's not. And therefore, they keep moving to the right. I think there's a real reason for that. Uh, when Emily's List started in 1985, uh, there were, I believe, 23 women in the U.S. House of Representatives. There were 12 Democratic women. There were 11 Republican women, mm -hmm. most of them pro-choice. You know, most of the, the ERA oh, of the yeah. 1970s and 80s were really driven by a lot of Republican women uh, in New England. Do you think about this? So the, the party has shifted and women have left the Republican Party because of it. <sighs> Did do a better job in 2020 recruiting a diverse sort of group of candidates. Uh, Republicans did better than we thought. I want to. I want to talk about some of your happy wins too. But I, I am <laughs> curious about that because I wonder, and I and I wonder, kind of being self reflective for me, if the media may, made too much of it because I I, I think um, we have a tendency to I don't know sometimes paint like I, I mean whatever we like drama in the media right but I but I also think that there is um, a sense of like, well, you know, if, if Republicans won, it's a mandate. And if Democrats won, is it really, I don't know. Like, I mean, so I, what do you think? Are, are there, are there any warning signs for you when you see the fact that, you know, I do think McCarthy, McCarthy and McConnell did recruit some more diverse women than in years past. And some of them won and some of them are on the extreme end of the party. So what does that tell you about the work that's left on the democratic side? Yeah, well, it really happened on the House side and not the Senate side. That's true. That's side, true. The Who Senate was side was yeah. really about incumbent protection, but but they won. They held, right, yeah. to, to be fair. And, and the Republican uh, House members, I mean, we, we did lose seats. Uh, the Democrats did. And what the what the Republicans were able to do, and I'm not sure I'm going to give it to the party or, or give it to a group of people like uh, Lee Stefanik, who's a Republican congresswoman out of New York, uh, uh, pushed to really get some more women to run for mm -hmm. office. And they did something that Emily's List has been doing for decades is they've got, they got more of those women through their primaries. See, what has been the problem, the challenge here is that the Republican women weren't getting through primaries mm. because they weren't seen as conservative enough, right wing enough. And so you end up with women who are almost like even further to the right uh, than, than we've seen ever before, frankly. Okay. And, then, and then once they're on the general election ballot, then you're talking about, do we have a way for one party or the other? It's less about the gender on a general election ballot. It's really, it's more about the partisanship uh, in, the, in the result of the election. Uh, the primaries is where it's at. Now, the question I have uh, is, are they going to continue that kind of recruitment hmm. or not? Is this a one-time shot or not? They also went from 13 to 25, when I which is, hey, I, good for them. Thumbs up. I, you got to applaud that effort. There are more than 91 Democratic women in the U.S. House. It took us 35 years to get there. Uh, we've been intentional about that work. Uh, and, and keep in mind, in 1985, we started equal. So it's not like they're it's not like they're running fast here at this. Uh, I was I was looking. I think I think when I started at Emily's List eleven years ago, the Republican women in the House were like at twenty one. Okay. So they went from twenty one 
back to 13 in 18 when the Democratic women did so well. Uh, and then they came back up to 25. So really, <laughs> they got some work to do. They got some work to do. Uh, and that's the honest to God truth. Yeah. Well, looking back a little further, I mean, in 2018, I know you write about the fact that just the MLA's list candidates that won were enough in numbers to flip the House back to give Nancy Pelosi the gavel back. Yes. Um, and you say that you promised Pelosi that Emily's list would help flip the house in 2018. How terrifying is that promise to make to someone like Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> and why did you believe you could do it? She, yeah, you, you, you've got to have some level of, I don't know, craziness in your head to do that. <laughs> to, to right? land, no, or, I know. <laughs> I know, right? What was I thinking? I was like, um, the, the truth is, is I had been, by the time I felt comfortable to make that promise, uh, was because I'd seen these candidates mm. coming up and build, and they, these so many of the 2018 uh, congressional candidates were first time candidates, yeah. women who had come from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, teachers and nurses, uh, CIA agents. I mean, I didn't even know you could run if you were in the CIA. <laughs> I, know, right? I didn't even know you could tell run. everybody you were a CIA agent. Every time I see Congresswoman Spamberg, I'm like, really? Like, what? What do you, what's, you know, she's like, no, nothing. She's like, so good. She's so good. Uh, and she's from Virginia here. She's like, so I'll tell you, I had to kill you kind of thing. I, I know. I was like, just, oh, okay, I'm out. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, just these amazing women who felt that they needed to step up and serve because the country was going in the wrong direction, their communities were going in the wrong direction, and, and they were putting together great organizations. And Emily's List uh, was very committed to the recruitment and placement of these women and then getting them the strong campaign. So I knew we had enough in play. It wasn't like we had 23 in play to pick up the majority, which is what we needed. We had 40, 40 to 50 in play. And I was like, okay, we got to deliver half of these. We got to do this. Uh, I will say my staff was not thrilled by this. <laughs> <laughs> this they're like, what and, did you uh, they're like, what did you? that's exactly right. That was pretty sad. They're like, you did what? Why, why did you? I said, but let's just, you know, sometimes it's, it's like fill their dreams. You know, you build it and they will come. If you well, say you got to count, like that's what Pelosi and Willie Brown are. Other, uh, <laughs> you know. There you go. That's, we got to do that. And we did it and it was amazing. And then we added another 10 women on top in safe democratic seats to have a historic year in 2018. And it was just awesome because it was, um, you know, we talk. I talk about this in the book with uh, you know Christina Reynolds, who's my my co writer, about how different this class of women were in in a variety of, of ways. And one was that it was the first time in real ways we saw candidates sort of breaking the rules, getting out of the box, doing it different, and and it was really awesome to see because you shouldn't have to do it the same way as everybody else. Like you, you like, you shouldn't have to do it the same way as the men. Yeah. We're women. So it, there should be different ways to do this and you should be able to talk about your family and talk mm -hmm. about your health and, t and talk about your authentic self without being judged. Now I'm not saying they weren't judged, but uh, you should be like MJ Hager who can run a TV ad about her tattoos on her arm when she was running for the congressional race in 18, the tattoos that were hiding, covering, or honoring, even as a better word for it, uh, the wounds that she had received in combat. I mean, I, and I talk about this in the book, I, in the 90s when I was recruiting folks, even men were like, hide the tattoo, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, don't show them the tattoo. People don't yeah. like tattoos. And here she is like running an ad on tattoos. <laughs> I mean, we are, well, that's what it should be, but it should be different. And that's what we saw. I'm curious, like, and I want to get into some of the book stuff, but you are part of the democratic establishment, but some outside as well, being a PAC, um, you know, there's a lot within our party politics that can sometimes prevent any new person from running because there's rules, unspoken, but rules against challenging incumbents and those sorts of things. I'm curious, like, if you think we need to rethink some of those and if, if you've seen, 
I mean, because I think on the right, like you said, you've seen some some challenges that have brought more, or even more extreme folks in. Um, but we've also seen, yeah, the AOCs of the world challenge right. sitting, you know, folks. And that's not something Nancy Pelosi blessed ahead of time, right? So, like, what, <laughs> how, do you, how do you just think about that question? I think it's one that's it's it's, it's, it's a real fundamental much. one. It's a it's a huge question. It's a huge question, and and Emily's list sits in a really st- sort of unique place in this because we are seen as establishment by sort of the left of the of the country, and and then the establishment often thinks of us as the anti-establishment, right? <laughs> So we get we get hit from both sides on a pretty regular basis. I understand um, that. Yeah, I, get, I bet you do. I bet you do completely. And so we're like, okay, this is our role. Right. Whatever and you think I am, I guess know I what's, am. You know what's nutty? The idea of electing women to office. Right. Like, you know, we the you know the entire uh, Congress is only twenty five percent women, and it's taken us thirty five years to change those numbers at all. I mean, we were you know, hardly anywhere just 35 years ago. So that we're still fighting from outside. And I think about the candidates that were running. These are not women uh, typically anymore that are coming up through the systems. I mean, Lauren Underwood, a congresswoman from, from Illinois, African-American woman, super amazing, uh, youngest African-American a woman to ever be elected to the U.S. House as a nurse, was never thinking about really running, maybe had an inkling after the, after the Women's March in 2017. Uh, but th- those are the kinds of women that are stepping up and you would never call her establishment. And, and we, we were there for her. Like, that's what we do. But you're right about the question of the incumbency. And I will even say at Emily's list, it's been a huge debate. I'm sure. Because we, we don't run against pro-choice Democratic incumbents, uh, women or men, either one. Uh, and, and honestly, we haven't done that historically because we have so much other work to do and there's so much other opportunities that frankly are easier. Like it's easier to beat an anti-choice Democrat in a primary, frankly, totally. in this environment. It's, it's, um, it's easier to go try to pick up a, a seat in a, um, you know, in a swing district because you can get so many more partners behind you. So we went sort of where, where it made the sense. That being, you know, that being said, I mean, Ayanna Presley, uh, who's now a congresswoman out of Massachusetts, she was one of our Gabrielle Gifford's Rising Star Award winners. We love Ayanna Presley. We've known her, you know, through her city council mm-hmm. career. We supported and endorsed her. We were working with her as she was thinking about running for lieutenant governor. Uh, and then she decided not to do that and to run against a sitting pro-choice Democratic congressman. And it was really hard for us. I bet. Because we were like, ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and sort of like, good luck. And I, a couple of my staff left to go work with her, which I was super supportive of. Uh, but the truth is we don't, you know, we, we haven't had a policy that goes against sitting incumbent uh, pro-choice members uh, Democratic members, and so that was hard. So we're that debate's happening uh, internally as we watch uh, great women like AOC and Ayanna Presley, Cory Bush, yeah. uh, in this last go around, uh, do this, and particularly now in California, where in the last few election cycles, you're of course under the rules of the big open primaries, where everybody's in one big primary. Mm. That really changes things too. So it's um. It's an evolving moment uh, in the culture and in politics. And I think it's a good debate to have. Yeah. Can I ask you, since you brought up California, um, you know, Kamala Harris actually wrote the foreword and you know, her leaving the Senate means we will no longer have a single black woman senator. No. She's been replaced by a very progressive first Latino from, San, uh, from California, which is sort of unbelievable in itself, but, but a man. Um, <laughs> what do you think of that? Do you be a good senator? I have all. all yeah. Uh, Were you disappointed though that she was not replaced by a woman? Uh, yes. 
Yes, yeah. we were. I mean, and I do think uh, Senator Padilla will be very, very good. I very, very happy for him. And and we need more men of color too. Like if we want to talk about the Senate, we're talking about a pretty white institution. So yeah. we need to be super intentional about that. And and you're right. I mean, come on, California. This is, <laughs> you really do need <laughs> the Latinx community. I get it. Totally understand. Uh, but that being said, yes, and and not not just because we want to continue to see more and more women in an institution that just still is not close to fifty percent. I mean, women, we are more than fifty percent of the population. This is ridiculous. Like we should be well over fifty percent of of the every governing body, and as Democrats, we should be even more because. Women are the ones who deliver democratic victories across the board, particularly women of color who stand by democratic candidates. So, um, yes, we were we were bummed about it, but we understand we have to be intentional about this work, though. That's the thing. It it doesn't happen easily, and uh, I can guarantee that we are looking hard and we're working to recruit. Uh, particularly Black women to run for the United States Senate. The fact that there's not a single Black woman voice in the Senate is outrageous. And so um, anybody out there who's, <laughs> anybody listening anywhere in the country who's thinking, <laughs> give us a call. Uh, we've, got, we've got some good ideas and uh, we're going to get there and we're going to get some uh, good Black women elected governor too. I'm you know, hoping as I like to refer to St. Stacey Abrams of Georgia, whatever she wants to do, we're there. We're with her. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about your book and, and really, which goes, you know, back on the history of Emily's list. So for those uninitiated, it, it started out of frustration that women weren't getting party support. Um, and I, I want to hear a little bit about your founding story and the connection to yeast, because it is sort of hilarious <laughs> as somebody who's been getting Christina Reynolds emails for like my entire adult life. I feel like, um, yeah. I didn't know that that's what it stood for. Oh, you're kidding. Really? <laughs> oh, that is so funny. So I, so for folks who don't know, Emily is not a person. It is an acronym that stands for early money is like yeast the kind of yeast that makes the bread dough rise. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just want to be clear. Just want to be clear there, you know, makes the dough rise. And if you think about what the challenges were when our founders came together uh, and they, they were women that were, Working with Geraldine Ferraro, who had just been, you know, in, in 1984, uh, chosen as the vice presidential nominee, first woman ever to be on a ticket, uh, and in a, what ended up being a disastrous election for the Democrat, uh, Walter mm -hmm. Mondale, and that ticket, uh, they were really frustrated at the, at the lack of support around her. Uh, they, these founders were very frustrated by the lack of support around Senate candidates. Now, granted, there were not many. <laughs> there weren't very many women running for office. Uh, but what would, what would happen is they would get started and the establishment, and I mean the party, uh, the Demo both parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party would say, well, you, you can't win because you can't raise any money. Well, the woman would say, well, I can't raise any money because you won't invest and tell people that I'm a viable candidate. And they're like, well, but you're not a viable candidate because you can't raise any money. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, and so Ellen Malcolm, our founder, who honestly is like a great American stateswoman, uh, it, it's her shoulders I stand upon as the second ever president, you know, figured out that what needed to happen, at least initially, was to get enough resources, not to fund the whole thing, but to get enough resources around women candidates so the party structure would say, oh, maybe maybe you can raise money. Now we'll invest in you. That was the whole foundation of Emily's List. Uh, and our very first candidate was uh, Barbara Mikulski. And for those of you who who may not remember her, she, she was the longest serving woman in Congress and was the first Democratic woman to be elected in her own right mm -hmm. uh, to the United States Senate in 1986. Uh, but it's like 
I know 1986 for some sounds like a really long time ago, but it's not, it's not like 1886. Yeah. I mean, the well, country's um, been around a long time. <laughs> I know. And I just interviewed Barbara Boxer earlier today and talking to her and exactly. Senator Gillibrand about, you know, at that point there was women couldn't work out in the gym. There was no oh, yeah. place to nurse or lactate. There was, but there was no woman's go. bathroom near the yeah. Senate. There was yeah. no Barbara Mikulski, Senator Mikulski had to run. Like if they had night votes, she would have to run back to her office or go to the public bathroom, restroom, because there was no women's bathroom, like in the cloak room of the Senate. I mean, what, are you kidding me? Yeah. This is insane. insane. It's insane. Um, and they're still fighting those fights. I mean, the, you know, we talk about this uh, in the book. I don't mean to jump ahead, but I'm just thinking about these fights that we're still fighting. Right. You know, Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, who um, came in uh, elected in 2016 and and came in uh, as a new mother. She had an infant, an, an infant that needed to be breastfed. And sometimes at night, when particularly the Senate was in long votes and they'd go like every 15 minutes, you can't leave. Or, you know, sometimes they do it in the day. They always feel like, I always feel like they do that during night just to like brutalize the I think they, yeah. To get it also, you have to get it done. (laughs) Right. But also not family friendly, not mother friendly, not father friendly. This is why we need more women making the rules. Because it wouldn't be a problem if they just stopped acting like college students and did stuff before they procrastinated. But that's. Yes. Yeah. yeah, That'd be nice. nice. (gasps) Well, I mean, so she just wanted to carry her child on the floor if she needed to. And they had a huge fight. And and Senator Amy Klobuchar in the from Minnesota uh, and all of the women and a number of the men, to be fair, backed up Tammy Duckworth in this endeavor. But Senator Orrin Hatch, a Republican uh, uh, who was serving at the time, literally said, I'm paraphrasing, but said, oh my God, if we do this, what are we going to do? There's going to be like 15, 20 babies on the floor. What are we going to do then? <laughs> and from whom? And Senator Cl- <laughs> right, exactly. And Senator Klobuchar, those likes, like, that's called progress. <laughs> also, look around. It's like a bunch of grandpas. I don't think. I, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, let's talk about, I mean, this book is really um, a, a roadmap for people who might want to run for office or really step into bigger leadership roles. And yes. we don't have to go through every every sort of thing that you go through, I really do encourage women who are interested in public service at all um, to check it out. Cause it's, it's very like utilitarian in some ways. Right. But, but a lot of what you talk about are things that like women have been telling me as a political reporter for years. So I want to kind of go through a few of those. Um, yeah, of course. And I mentioned that Kamala Harris wrote your forward and she says something that I think is a real theme throughout your book and for women, which is if I had listened to what people told me was possible, I would not be here today. Um, and that dovetails with another thing we hear a lot, which is that women have to be asked to run, that they have probably more self-doubt than men do. So talk to me about that. And how do you convince women who are not, don't envision themselves, which you really have to do in these positions that, yeah, they are the right person, that they are as good at, you know, as good of an option as any white dude who's felt like he could do it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and for, and for decades, that's pretty much solely what Emily's List did was just literally show up in people's houses, and <laughs> sit down at kitchen tables and say, you can do this and walk through every step of the way, what it's like and, uh, and really convince or, or beg. Sometimes there was some begging right. sometimes. Uh, and, you know, in my experience with recruiting over the years, and frankly, when I also make big decisions, I probably fall into this category too. So I got to take some ownership of this. We're list makers. A lot of women are list makers. A lot of us need pros and con lists. We need to know exactly how it's going to work. If you're a mother, you got to know exactly what's going to happen with the kids. Uh, Just There's just a lot of questions. And I remember sitting down with... Well, with Elizabeth Warren, when she was uh, getting recruited, we were, there, there was almost some begging to get her to run for the Which United is so States. crazy, right? It's crazy okay. in hindsight now. Look at, I mean, she's just been phenomenal yeah. uh, and, and just had already done so many wonderful things, but she'd never run for office. I mean, think about that. She, her first office she ran for was U.S. Senate, which is pretty it's pretty badass. Let's just say it. Yeah. Uh, but she um, she wanted to know exactly how it worked. 
how do you find the staff? Where does the money come from? How do you build out this? You know, how do you put up with the stress of it? How do you, how do you get your husband to not like kill somebody who's saying yeah. mean things about you? Right. <laughs> yeah. Like all of these questions and you just answer them because there are answers for all of us. And here's the thing. This isn't, you know, running for office is not like going to the moon. I don't think. I mean, going to the moon seems hard to me. Now, maybe <laughs> it's not, but it seems rocket science seems like a whole big hard thing to do. This is about putting the pieces together. And Christina and I wanted to put together a book that was a roadmap of some of the major questions that that are facing candidates, but that also could be used for women who are looking to rise up in leadership anywhere. Mm-hmm. Like that, we need women at the decision-making tables. We need women leading the decision-making tables. And I don't just mean in Congress or in your legislature in Sacramento. I mean in the corporate boardrooms. I mean in Hollywood. I mean in small businesses and big. We need women. To, we need them in the editorial rooms. We need them owning, owning the media. You know, I just like that's, so what do we need to do? We need to get sometimes through our own thinking and say, we can do this. Yeah. And then we need to all stick together and do it together, right? And build that network and that community to, to get this done. And I think that's, that's all these pieces of things um, that, that we talk about in the book. Yeah. Well, you write that having all the qualifications isn't the question women should ask before running. What should they ask themselves? I mean, I think that, you know, you... Uh, more so than any other job you apply for, you literally have to go out and make the case to thousands, sometimes more people, right? So like, what should you look for in yourself to know, okay, I'm the right person? Oh, I think I think it starts with, do you have a passion for change? Like, do you what? Like, do you want, or or is there something that's driving that you want to make a change in the society, in the in the culture, in the community? I mean, maybe it's the city council, maybe it's the school board, and the schools. Maybe it's the United States House of Representatives. What, whatever it is, uh, start there. You know, I'd say start there uh, because here's the thing: you can figure out how to do it. Like we, with our organizations like Emily's List that will give you the skills to do it. And all these skills are, are learnable. Oh. Like, you know, you don't need to be the best, most charismatic speaker in the world to get elected. I mean, look. I mean, look at Nancy <laughs> Pelosi. Like, I love her. She can whip votes, she's but she's not the best amazing. public speaker. But she, but she knows what everybody's doing and yeah. she's a great networker and she keeps lists in her head about exactly. everything that's going on. <laughs> and she's brilliant. She brings her own skills. Uh, that's, that's what we need. And in fact, we need diversity of those skills. Right, you yeah. need the great public speakers, and you need the vote counters. You you need all of that. So you got to think about first the why and what's driving you, because it's hard to do these jobs. Yeah, well, your job, my job, they are hard jobs to do. So you need to have something that's driving you deep down to keep on doing it. Uh, so look about, think about that first, and I'll tell you, you got it. Yeah, I, I I just believe everybody's got it. I really do. I know just uh, you know, t- to step up and do it. You just got to figure out what it is that's going to drive you. Then you got to think about, you know, do you have the energy for it? You mm-hmm. know, particularly if you're running for office, it, it does take a lot of energy. It also takes a lot of resources. And I don't just mean raising money for the campaign. Unfortunately, in so many places in our system, it's expensive personally, yeah, for the family, financially, and emotionally. Uh, some of these legislatures around our country pay nothing. They might give you a per diem. It is terrible. We are asking people to govern, and we're not even giving them enough to live on, to pay rent. That is outrageous to me and something I think we absolutely need to deal with because if we want more women and more and more people of color to be in these offices, which we need to have a true representative democracy, then we have to change how we support those elected officials. Now, that's not necessarily a situation in Congress. And frankly, it's not really a situation in Sacramento. I think it's actually uh, 
a positive thing in California that folks actually uh, can survive in this in those jobs. In Colorado, you make no. It's literally it's like a per diem. Well, it's a part time. Yeah. Well, I always think of. I remember you miss your job. Like, what are you going to do? You got to you got to be at the Capitol for for ninety days. Right, and even in California, you know, we've done things like take away the pensions of lawmakers and and other perks. And I mean, I've always just thought, you know, maybe if you just paid them more on par with what lobbyists make, we won't even have problems of corruption and you know that's a whole other conversation what i do think about though because this is a real like logistical practical thing like katie porter you know has a great line about watching that meme of nancy pelosi walk out of uh the white house and that fabulous quote put on her sunglasses and katie porter's like yes nancy pelosi's a badass but also that coat costs three thousand dollars like i'm a single (laughs) mom raising three kids you know so I do think that those like very practical questions, like you write about the woman who went to the FEC to get childcare costs That's allowed right. under, I mean, That's those right. are like real life. Well, I honestly think there should be some sort of, I think there should be a partisan truce on candidates getting some sort of salary from the campaigns. I, I stand, I, I know, I know a lot of people disagree with me on this. I know a lot of campaigns actually run negative ads on on other candidates because of this issue. But honestly, we are asking people to give up their livelihoods for sometimes two years, no money, no income. How in the world can you do that? How can you do that and run for Congress for two years with no salary because you get a full-time job to run for Congress anymore? Because it just right. is. Because you got to raise all this money and you got to you got to meet everybody in the community and you got to get to understand the community. Then we should be able to at least. I'm not talking about getting rich here. I'm like pay the rent, be able to pay your pay bills. the mortgage, you like pay the child care. Maybe have some food on the table. Like I'm not, I'm not talking about. No one's getting rich here running for office. Like well, you know, it's just, it's like later, later they get rich. Way, yeah, way, le- way later, <laughs> except for Joe Biden. Um, you go really far, but that's that's something you got to think about. We got to change. On the other hand, we live in a country where Nancy Pelosi and her beautiful coat and Katie Porter. The single mom in her minivan, both, yeah, in her minivan can, can both guess what? They both have a vote in the United States House of Representatives. Yeah, how cool is that? No, totally right. How cool is that? Uh, that's what this is all about, and why diversity of voices. How important Katie Porter's work has been. I can't imagine the last two years without Congresswoman Porter. Uh, in Congress. I can't imagine the last two years without, say, Lucy McBath uh, from Georgia, African-American woman uh, who lost her son to gun violence, uh, being such a driving force uh, for gun safety legislation in this country. I mean, it's just, it's amazing, but these are, they're just folks like us, you know? It's, yeah. Well, and Pelosi's a superhero in her and with the five kids and uh, yeah, she's done lots even. of grandchildren and she keeps track and she still keeps track of everybody. <laughs> oh, she does. Yes. So <laughs> you brought up, I mean, we're talking about money. Let's talk about fundraising. Cause I think that's another huge hurdle for anybody. You are one of those weird people who say you like fundraising. I don't mind it. I know. Um, I might be weird. I, might be I weird. mean, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> we don't need to go like, again, like there, there's a lot of detail in the book, but I'm curious, like, what is the, if somebody is just terrified of this, as a new candidate, what's the first advice you all give them at Emily's List for kind of getting past their own mental hurdle? Think of it as asking for an investment in the future. Try to get it out of it being about you. I mean, it it is about you, but like, don't think about it. It's about the country. It's about good public servants. It's about making change. And so if you can get your mind in that space, uh, it's a much healthier place to be. And I would argue is true. <laughs> like we, yeah. we, we need good uh, women of diverse backgrounds to run for office. You need resources to do that. The reason we need those women there is because we're going to get better policies. So Think of it as investing in the future and and go that direction and think about it that way. Um, that's the key. Did, um, I mean, have you ever had, or at the beginning, was it 
were you more emotionally tied to whether someone said yes or no? Like, is part of it that is sort of like letting yourself not be as, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, you, you know. You got to get used to no. Yeah. <laughs> you did no, no comes, or the, or the worst where you really got to get practiced is, you know, let me think about it. And you're mm-hmm. like, no, don't let them off you're the like, phone. Oh, yeah. answer. You got to get an answer. You, you got to figure it out. Uh, and you just gotta, you gotta push, you gotta push because this is important. You know, and if somebody says no, they say no. Now they might be just, I will also say a no in my mind means not now. Ask later. (laughs) Yeah. Like, okay, you can't do it now. Can I call you back in a little bit? Tell you how the campaign's going down the road. And you almost always get a yes to that. Interesting. Almost always. Um, so, so, so yeah. And then one of the others, and we kind of hit on this a little bit with the, that candidate, I can't remember her name right now with the tattoos and stuff, but like the oh, yeah, women's right. looks, I mean, in general, right. There is the an expectation of both men and women of what you should look like to be a politician. I think it's even more pronounced for women, but it is changing. And yes. I'm curious, like how, if it feels like it's changed pretty quickly in the last few cycles with a lot of these women and, and younger women. Um, but I mean, what's the advice you're giving now compared to the kind of like, you know, get the bob in the pantsuit, like right. 30 just, years ago. You got to bring up the bob in the pantsuit, yeah. right? You know, I just, it was like my total uniform in the 1990s. Was yeah. That? <laughs> like uh, the Navy suit or the black suit. Maybe and I mean, a to little be bit fair, of the women like running for president this year were mostly still in that mold, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, we, because we have to run all over the country. And yeah. there's still a little bit of a look that people expect in right. their leaders. Like that is true. It's just partially how this is still, but here's the good news. It's starting to change. And the more it changes, the more it opens up for more diverse voices coming in who don't feel hampered by having to look and act a very specific way. And let's face it, um, a, a, a Bob in a, in a Navy pantsuit or a black pants and usually Navy, uh, is a very masculine look. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and I, I've had Bob's lots of times, but it's, it is more, it is more in the box of what the establishment of masculinity would expect uh, because you're supposed to look the part and the, just the length of women's hair in the 11 years I've been at, at Emily's list has gotten longer and is more acceptable. I mean, how crazy is that, that I've noticed that? Like, that's actually a thing. Uh, And we, you know, I I fully admit that we're an organization that early on talked about getting the haircuts. Like, the hair was too long, Mm -hmm. and folks weren't open to the longer hair, and which is so ridiculous that we're even having this conversation. Uh, but, But particularly with the up and coming generations of both the, the millennial generation and Gen Z. I think I'm so excited because <laughs> I think they're like, no, yeah. <laughs> we're going to do it our way. You know, and sometimes like if it just goes too far, uh, I suppose in some communities, they're just more conservative, including in their attire than other communities. And so you got to be aware. Well, that's the whole point of Congress, right? You got to reflect right? your district. Yes. You know? yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. it doesn't mean you can't push the envelope a little bit. Yeah. And for uh, women, I'm asking you just push the envelope a little bit. That's okay. Yeah. Like, well. You don't have to wear pantyhose all the time anymore. Totally. Huge win. <laughs> well, we're on the West Coast here. We never wear pantyhose. I know, I know. Though I bet you did. I bet you all. I bet you that they did in the eighties. No, they did in the nineties, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, we have an audience question, and I think this kind of dovetails, which is, what's your advice to women who came of age in the digital world? And they bring up former Representative Katie Hill asking if that's a cautionary tale for all of us. Um, I would kind of go a step further and ask, you know, do you think she should have stepped down? Yeah, that was, God, that was such a hard, mo- it was so awful. The whole situation was so awful. You yeah. know, you, you just, I mean, truly what she, what she went through and, uh, and it was, these are one of those moments uh, and there were a lot of factors involved in, in her situation that elected officials have to 
make a decision in the moment. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't, that, that's part of the deal of, of being an elected official. And she looked at everything that was going on and, and made the, made the decision that was best for her at that moment. And I back her up in any decision she, she made. Uh, the, the digital question is, is going to be a very interesting one that's going to keep evolving, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't, I mean, maybe, thank goodness, I don't have pictures of myself from, the, like, my high school I am, years. Like, uh, Facebook you know. wasn't around when I was at UC Santa Barbara, thank God. I mean. No. And yes. <laughs> I mean, let's just be, and, 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 and every, everybody watching of a certain age is probably like, oh, yeah. Right, yeah. Right, you know? But we have now two generations uh, that have everything online. And that is just going to, I hope, I hope, loosen everybody up. Yeah. Like, like just loosen up a little bit here. <laughs> like, remember what your life was like. Remember, just try to remember what you were doing in college and let it go. Like, you just yeah. got to loosen it up. And, and I think that that will work itself, I hope it will work itself out because it is a, it is, you know, a challenge. Now it is something we do because it does come up and, and your opponents will pull things off all the time, particularly photos uh, and video. Um, The media looks at it. Everybody's looking at it. Uh, So we do walk through with our potential candidates that you should do a full analysis of what's out there. Because the one thing we say uh, you know, as you're thinking about stepping in or as you're getting ready to run for office, you got to know what's out there. Right. You know, doesn't mean you can't do it. I'm not, you know, it doesn't mean, okay, I've got five bad pictures on Facebook and I can't run for office now. No, no, that's not what we're saying. Just do an audit, know what it is. And that's, you know, have you paid all your parking tickets? I mean, so an audit of your entire life, we always call it self-research, understand, you know, what you've done in your past, and then to make sure that you have an explanation or an answer or deal with it uh, before you get started. That's, that's the key piece, because let's face it, nobody's perfect. We've all done things. That's yeah. okay. That, that's what makes us human. Uh, it also is what campaigns use to attack you, and and that goes both directions. So just be prepared for those types of attacks and have an answer for it. Yeah, got to do that self opposition research. You really you, do. Yeah, you really <laughs> do. Right? We do not live in an era where you can let that go. Not yet, <laughs> and that probably maybe will never happen. <laughs> um. Well, on the other end of the age and experience spectrum uh, in California is Senator Dianne Feinstein. And I'm curious what you make of increasing criticisms of her, um, you know, both by people who have never agreed with her politics. She is more of a centrist um, and the state has changed significantly since she was elected in 92. Um, And there's also questions about her age and if she's slowing down. And I think, you know, (laughs) it, it, some of them might be valid for us to ask as voters and as constituents, but th- it does all feel tinged given that she's a woman. So how do you think about this stuff and, and how, I don't know, do you think people like myself even should be talking about it? Cause it is so sensitive. Yeah, you know, it, it is ch- because we've had plenty. I mean, if you look at American history, <laughs> <laughs> plenty of, I mean, she's the first basically older a woman to serve in in office. Yeah, he's like breaking. But shouldn't back. Strom Thurmond have stepped down earlier? Or like you know, like you know Jesse Holmes. You're like yeah. long long list. Yeah, you know, Patrick uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, but on the other hand, they also you know served and they served. I can disagree immensely with the conservative men that we're talking about. But I mean, Bob Bird was there until he was. Over 100 years old, and uh, and he always delivered for the state of West Virginia. Like they, the voters decided that they wanted him to stay. Yeah. Ultimately, this is about elections and the voters, uh, and the candidate or the elected official has got to decide if she or he or they are are 
prepared and ready to continue service or not. You know, and in the case of Senator Feinstein, I mean, she has dedicated her life to service in the state of California and the city of San Francisco. And she'll have to make those decisions and then the voters have to make theirs. Yeah. I mean, it is more complicated, I think, in the sense of like in a state like this, you do have the party and the relationship. You know, it's not as if anybody, um, I think, in their right mind. Well, that's that could get me in trouble. A lot of a lot of folks within the establishment are very reticent to try to want to challenge somebody, even if they don't feel, you know, within their party, even if they don't feel like they're serving the constituents in the right way. So it, it can get a little more complicated, I would say. Well, and you've got a you've got an interesting dynamic because because of the way California's primary system is set up now. Yeah, where it's open, so you you've got a whole nother series of um, interesting uh, yes. things happen. And you're it's just and it's just you in Washington State, uh, California and Washington State that have those those systems that make it a little bit different. Um, not good or bad, just different. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, the other- just think about you got to think about when you're running. Why are you running? Mm-hmm. Now, why are you running for office? And and one of the things I've just completely loved about being at Emily's list is that you. Yeah, hey, I'm not arguing that. I actually I think women should have more ambition. I I, I, I love I, I I hate when you know they're attacked for ambition all the time. By the way, right? I mean we know that, and that drives us crazy because of course women should have ambition. Like, come on, give me a break. And I'm like, have more. Like that's that's awesome. Uh, but what I but I what I've seen driving women, uh, and women of all backgrounds, all races, all geographies, is the great great desire to get something done, to to make a change. Something has ignited their desire for public service, and then sometimes we have to push them into okay, you want to make the change, we need you to run for elected office, and mm-hmm. that's like the push that we have to get them over. Uh, but that's. That's usually the driving factor. There's something, you know, there's the something went wrong with the schools and I want to do something about it. Some, something's going wrong with the recycling program. Something's going like whatever it is. Right. Uh, there's something uh, that starts the activism. And we're just saying, rise up and take leadership. Okay. Yeah. Just rise up. Um, we have maybe five or seven minutes left and I do want to ask you what's next for you because you're stepping down in March from Emily's list. But before I did want to just hit on Nancy Pelosi, um, has telegraphed her intentions to step down as speaker after this year. And she's really surrounded by mostly men in leadership who are close to her age. And I'm just curious, like what you're hoping to see for the next generation of house leadership as we move toward this transition in a couple of years. Oh my gosh. And there are so many great House members in the Democratic caucus right now. Uh, it's like, it's awesome. And so many great women. And there are some great men. I don't need to be like, there really are. Uh, very proud of the women. Um, but, you know, but I think it is really, I mean, talk about shoes to fill. You know, a lot of folks, you know, talk about shoes. Nancy Pelosi is awesome. I'm sorry. I mean, she's awesome. I don't know what else. She teaches me something all the time. I am, I I just want to like sit at her knee and go, just tell me. (laughs) I need to know. And it will never, there'll never be enough time. And she could even do it because she just does it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's intuitive. Huge shoes to fill. Uh, But we have such great uh, diversity of voices in 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 youth and in and racial diversity that i'm i'm hoping to see you know a whole new generation rise up and i i and, and they're coming and they're coming and i'm really really proud of uh congresswoman Catherine clark who's you know now really you know still relatively new to congress she's from massachusetts but the, is the assistant speaker but underneath there's just you know look at the class of 18 i don't know like these these are really great great elected officials. Uh, and so we're going to see, we're going to see some great leaders and they don't just have to be the speaker or the, right. assistant. there's a lot of, right. Yeah, there's so many voices. And I think that's for our, our party. As I speak as a Democrat, we need to do an even better job of lifting up the voices of our rising leaders because mm-hmm. they are 
fabulous, like so good. And it's, it's one of the things at Emily's list I'm, I'm really most proud of is our Rising Star Award winner uh, that we have every year named after Gabrielle Giffords. And it's, it's a place where, you know, the very first award winner Stacey Abrams. Like, we need just, a pretty good. Just some, just just some that lady. Out there. Just, just some lady out. from Georgia you might have yeah, heard just of. Somebody, yeah, she's maybe been in the news a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about you, Stephanie? What is next? Are you going to run for office ever? Like, what, 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 what is your That next? is such a good question. I, I, I'll tell you what is immediately next is I'm going to take a little bit of time and I want to like have some conversations and think about what's next. I don't want to just jump into something right away. Uh, I'm not, I'm not leaving the the battlefield so to speak uh, but I want to think through where what else I can do because Emily's list is in great shape and I'm I'm so proud of the, of the work and there's gonna they'll do a search and they'll have a great leader but I don't I don't know what's next and I will say I am not intending on running for office uh, anytime soon but as I tell every woman and I will tell everybody who is listening you cannot say no. You can say not now, <laughs> but you can't say no because you never know when your community is going to call upon you to lead. And so I'm always careful to not say no, uh, but but not right now. All right. All right. Well, you deserve a break. I, I will say that. It's been quite a few years. Um, our last question, it is an informed tradition to ask all our speakers just a tiny little final question, which is, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? What is yours, Stephanie? Okay, again, not rocket science, though that's really great. We need to elect more women and more women of color, more black and brown women to every governing body in the world, as far as I'm concerned, because we are more than 50% of the population and we should truly have a representative government to ensure that we have representative policies that take care of everybody in the community and not just a select few. It's very simple. We got to elect more women, particularly black and brown women. I feel like that was an easier one for you than for Yeah, some. it probably, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Someday I guess Nobody it's going to turn this coming. around on me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was lovely talking to you oh, and getting your perspective. Thank you huge so much. Pleasure. The pleasure is mine. And I'm just so honored to, to be here again. Thank you to the, to the Commonwealth club. It's I just, so when I heard I was doing this, I was just like, what? <laughs> that is so cool. Uh, what you've got going on in San Francisco is really special. And uh, I'm glad that you're part of it too, Marisa and everything you do. Cause by the way, being a journalist right now, not the easiest thing in the world either. And so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Um, thank you to Stephanie Shirock again. Shirock, I got it the right, the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Stephanie Shirag for joining us today on Inform at the Commonwealth Club. We would like to remind our audience that Stephanie's new book, Run to Win, is available at your preferred bookseller. Um, if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit the commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Marisa Lagos. I look forward to doing this in person, hopefully sometime later this year. Thank you all and stay safe.